excited and honored to that Double Edge is, is uh, hosting this event today, The Power of Hip Hop Culture, um, with our guests, Clyde Valentine and Will Power. Um, as many of you know, Double Edge is core to our mission to create a living culture. Uh, I believe that culture has an ability to awaken people, and that a, a culture that is living, the spectator, the community, the, 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 the citizens are, are actually engaged, not only passive receiving a work of art or, or a message or a mandate uh, and, and then going on with their lives, but there is um, a dialogue. There is a call and response, there is engagement, and there is hopefully in a culture that's truly alive, uh, some form of awakening. Um, we wanted to do this conversation, the, the power of hip hop culture, because uh, hip hop culture is in our, in our ideals, in our vision, a living culture. It is more than one entity, more than one uh, manifestation uh, or expression. It's more than music, it's more than a fashion, it's more than uh, a mode of expression, it's more than, it is a, a multitude. And it is a global multitude. Uh, it speaks to, and it speaks to young people. Um, we have young people here, uh, in our community, here as part of the theater, uh, for whom this multitude is really important. And, uh, we wanted, and it, we want to share other sort of models, other ways where living culture <coughs> exists and where it is affecting change and where it is creating new awakenings. Um, so with that, I will pass it over and just say how honored and glad we are, whether, and welcome to those of you who are watching from farther away. Um, but I'll now pass it over to uh, Eugenio Uriona, and thank you to Clyde and Will for being here today. Cool. Uh, Welcome. How are we doing? Good. Yeah. 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 Nice. Um, my name is Eugenio Uriona. Um, I was born in Argentina, and uh, I lived here part of my life. So, welcome to mi casa. Um, uh, I would like to say before we start that this is being web streamed, so if we could turn on anything that uses Wi-Fi and not have it on, because we want to give also the opportunity to you guys to talk and ask questions and engage in the discussion, and also for them on the internet to ask questions. So um, basically, uh, I live in the sticks. There's, it's not Brooklyn out here. It's not Compton, but. Throughout life, I've, I've listened to hip hop because hip hop has been something that has helped me grasp English a lot better, you know? Um, so it's informed my life in a big way. So I'm at a point here where I want to do something with it. But I have these questions of what can I do with it? What should I do? How do I motivate myself? How do we motivate our peers to do something with this? So um, that's, I met Clyde in October. Um, he took me on this internship, and I helped at a festival where I was doing PA work, you know, helping out with the DJ booth, with the, the, with the mural, with the setup, everything. And afterwards, we had a discussion about that, about how do we work with this? How do we make what we want to make out of it? And what, what are the struggles? What are our challenges? What, are, what do we do? So... That's pretty much where I'm coming from, but of course everybody's going to have something to contribute. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves because they can do that a lot better than I can. So I'm going to pass it to Will. And thank you again. <clears throat> All right. My name is Will Power. I'll try to keep this real brief, which is hard for me, but I'll try to do it. And uh, my introduction into hip hop many moons ago, um, I started off as a, a break dancer and I was whack. I was terrible. <laughs> and <laughs> I couldn't knee spin. I couldn't even knee spin, man. Like, I, you know, you can't knee spin. Man. But uh, it was really bad. And at this time, I'm from the West Coast originally. I'm from California. So at this time, break dancing was the first kind of element of hip hop culture that really came in and really became real popular. And at that time, the trend of the moment was to, uh, to call someone out to a spontaneous hip hop battle. You know, so you'd be like walking down the street and someone would look at you and be like. <laughs> you know, and you'd have to get down either on a piece of linoleum if someone had it or, or something and do it. Someone would call you off the bus and you'd get off the bus, you know, and that kind of thing. So I was getting taken out left and right and getting embarrassed. It was just terrible. And uh, 
this is like, by this time, this is like 1984, and I was already a theater artist. I was already kind of a child studying theater. So I started to shift to rhyming, to kind of putting my ideas into rhyme, into verse. And it was just kind of a more natural thing for me to express it that way, you know? And so I got these tools. And at first, they became a, things to just have fun. We would rhyme against other crews in different parts of the, uh, the city in California where I'm at, where I was, and um, something fun to do. And around the time that I started to rhyme, this is also when kind of the whole war on drugs, crack cocaine, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but the infestation and the drama of the 1980s, you know, started coming into these urban neighborhoods. So suddenly, this thing that we did that was for fun became actually a, a surviving tool. You know, it became a way to kind of stay out of trouble or express things that were going on. In my neighborhood in the 70s, there was some violence, there was some drama, but it wasn't that much. But when we got into like the mid 80s and Reagan's second term, it was just crazy. So, you know, any kind of stereotypical thing you could think of was happening. Like, you know, just drive-bys, friends getting killed in front of me, uh, people getting beat up, family members overdosing drugs. And so this tool, this hip hop tool, as far as, you know, you talked about change and empowerment. Initially for me, it was for me personally to just survive in that, in that era, you know? Um, as I continue to develop it, you know, and on the West Coast, and this is something I want to tell you too, you know, on the West Coast initially, we were trying to sound like we were from New York because that, that's, that's who the, the popular people were of the day. So it's like, you're around the state and run DMC. You know, that kind of thing. I know that's a bad interpretation, dude. <laughs> you got it, you know? So that's what we tried to do, you know? And we wouldn't get any respect. And obviously now there's a rich history of hip hop on the West Coast, everything from, you know, Tupac to, you know, to, to Kendrick Lamar to everything. But back then, the idea of being an MC from the West Coast was crazy. It was like, well, if you guys don't rhyme, you, you know, who are you faking, you know, that kind of thing. But what started to happen is as a, as a culture, as in a region, we start to develop our own style or styles that were really authentic to who we were. And those styles stretched the gamut from, you know, gangster rappers, which was a part of California, to, you know, cats that ate tofu and walked around in sandals like Michael Franti. You know, that, all, that was a, all that and in between was a part of the California aesthetic. You know, Jerry Curls, the dreadlocks was kind of what was what was happening, you know? So um, we start to develop our own, our own style. And for me personally, the kind of hip hop I've always done, I'm an, I was an MC and I was also an actor, but it was always about the live arena, you know? And hip hop culture originally was a performance-based culture. It was about the ritual of bringing community together, you know what I mean, to kind of heal and to express. And then it started to become more of a recording-based culture. So by the time I came of age in the 90s, it was really about like how good was your CD, you know? <laughs> And the challenge for my group is we were, we, our contemporaries were, and I'm showing my age here, people like, you know, Digital Underground, Tupac around, The Coup, I don't know if you know who that is, but we came up together, um, Living Legends, Hieroglyphics, Michael Franti, they were all my friends and contemporaries in this, in this world in the early 90s. And their records were better than our, us and our live shows were always better. We had like a live band and dancers and actors and, but it was tricky because a lot of my friends were getting these multi, you know, $100,000 deals. And we had record companies around, they were like, you know, but how do you do what you do live? How do you put that on CD? Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of pressure. We were like, we don't know. So we were trying to figure out how to take what we do live and put it on into a recording format. And it was really frustrating. And eventually I figured out that my form of hip hop was supposed to excel in the live arena. It was supposed to be such that we, we, you came into this and you had an experience and then you went out, you know? And so we kind of start to develop this thing, me and another number of artists, kind of hip hop theater, you know, which was kind of like the idea of mixing theater and, and narrative with the narrative and verse of, of hip hop and telling stories that way. And also some of my actors, you know, we were doing a lot of bars and they'd like step on a broken bottle and they were like, I'm an, I'm an artist, I can't do this anymore, you know. So we, so, so we start to take our hip hop into like, we start to take it into, we were some of the first groups to take it into theaters and into black boxes and into activist spaces in that way, you know. Um, so anyway, that's a, little, that's a little bit about my trajectory, you know, and now I use it, I, I, I don't just explore in hip hop, but I still use it as a tool for teaching, you know, around the globe, and, and we can get into that. But initially, it started as a personal thing, a way to kind of have fun, to express yourself, and, um, and, um, and, to, and to heal in that environment. Thanks, Will. Um, so, you know, our goal here is just to introduce ourselves a little bit and then really jump into the conversation part. So, you know, that's really important, and it's also important for the folks uh, that, are, that, are, that are tuning in. 
Um, and I think we're using the hashtag since this is on How Around as well, New Play, so we can you know track some questions from uh, wherever you might be. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I was, uh, I think we're in a similar age. Uh, I was born in 1971. And, um, you know, I think my first experience with, uh, with the culture was really on the streets. You know, um, I, I got to experience a, a street dance form called uprocking. Uh, you know, and I'm not an expert, but, you know, in this, but I knew what it was. And, and there were the, the older teenagers were doing it when I was like, you know, nine you know, 10, maybe even younger. And, you know, we would, you know, we'd be little guys like wanted to just see what was happening in the Apache line, and uh, which is what they did. It was a war dance, basically. Uprocking is very war, violent driven, um, and kind of came right out of gang culture uh, in, in New York City. And uh, that kind of stood with me. And then when I got a little bit older, right, uh, I started uh, writing graffiti, not very well. Right, you know, and I just kind of kept it in the neighborhood. I was too scared to jump into the tunnels, um, so I didn't want to do that. Um, I was popping and locking, you know, a little bit of break dancing, not super athletic, so you know, I popped and locked, which was more of a West Coast form, um, but it was already in the East Coast at that time, and you know, I caught that kind of late in the in the the, the mid '80s, um, and you know. For the younger folks in the room, like, I remember my dad distinctly, like, saying, oh, this stuff is a fad. What you're listening to right now isn't going to last. You know, it was a real, like, real ages. You know, he was like, ah, oh, this, you know, this is a fad. And I was just kind of like, I didn't even understand what he was saying. Um, but, you know, it, it just stood with me. I did all those things. Um, and, and, and by the time I got to high school, uh, it was about, uh, it started being about money and getting money. Right, so the dance crews turned into uh, the dance. Yeah, the dance crews turned into crews, just crews, and folks kind of stopped dancing, and it really became about like, um, you know, crack and drug dealing, and 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 um, you know, I didn't really do any of that, and I was kind of, um, you know, I moved away from that stuff because uh, you know, just personally, my my family was very invested in the street stuff, so that that was my biggest drug prevention. You know, I was like, I'm not going to, you know, I see the worst of this stuff, right? Uh, so there was no way I was going to broker in it, you know, and I had that conversation essentially with myself as a young person. So I got heavy into club culture in New York City, uh, like 15 through 19, you know? And at the time in New York City, you can go to a club at 15 years old, you know? I mean, it maybe wasn't right, but they weren't carding and, you know... Uh, so I was, you know, spent a lot of time in the club court, and and there was a little bit of uh, an overlap there. And and for the music heads in the room, you know, uh, look at early Jungle Brothers, right? And um, you know, you'll you'll hear some house hip hop tracks, right? Because they they were part of that bridge, and the Jungle Brothers were kind of the original native tongues. And when you think about native tongues, it might be for some of you, uh, uh, Tribe Called Quest. De La Soul, and then later Tali Kwali, Most Deaf, Common, right? That That's kind of like a native tongues, you know, collective, right? And then maybe some folks on the West Coast. Uh, then later on, you know, I was in college and all these magazines started coming out, right? So media started to explode, right? And, uh, you know, I would go to the Barnes and Noble and I was like devouring, you know, the source and rap pages and, and uh, the, very, the launch issue of Vibe had Snoop Dogg on it, right? Uh, who's now Snoop Lion or something, right? <laughs> um, you know, but Snoop's been around a long time, you, you, you know, as an artist. You know, so, so, you know, I was like eating all that stu stuff up. And then the game changer for me was this book called Bomb the Suburbs by, by uh, Billy, uh, Billy Wimsat, Upski, right? Upski was a graffiti writer from Chicago. And, you know, he was a peer. And he was, you know, he was uh, essentially it was a, a collection of essays that he self-published, that he sold out of his book bag, 20,000 copies out of his book bag. So while Katz was selling CDs, Opsky was selling books, right? And it was a lot of reflection, like, okay, we're graffiti writers in Chicago, and, you know, what are the long-term health implications to 
you know, this aerosol that we're inhaling if we don't use masks, right? Um, I didn't know anybody that was asking those questions as writers in New York, you know? Um, also, I'm an upper middle class white kid from, the, the, from North Chicago. What are the implications of me bombing with my friends from the South Side, you know? He, you know, he came from a different background, so him writing a book was interesting, but it really kind of uh, made me think about the, the potential for the culture beyond uh, what was beginning to happen, which was just rap music, right? So when I, uh, and I hate to put it that way, because I, I don't want to, you know, I don't sound like a hater. So fast forward, I, I graduate from college. And, uh, I, and, I, and I share this with young people when I speak to them. I, I, I wasn't super focused on what I wanted to do, but I know I wanted to do two things. I wanted to work in my community, my immediate community, where I, where I grew up, Sunset Park, Brooklyn, right? And um, I wanted to work around hip hop culture in some way. And to me, that was the definition of my community. It was like very specific and also a little bit broader. Um, so I had an opportunity to start a publishing company, a magazine called Stress. Right, with a group of friends from New York and some of my homies from college. Uh, so we didn't start in the garage, you know. We, you know, started in the office in Midtown. We raised some seed money. We were right on 34th Street, Pennsylvania building. And um, the first issue we put uh, Raekwon from Wu Tang on the cover with a bulletproof vest and a and a blunt, right? <laughs> and I remember, and a blunt is a uh, cigar filled with marijuana. Right? Um, so, you know, I, I was, uh, I remember bringing it to this other thing that I was doing, which was organizing this youth conference, and one of the elders got really upset with me, right? And he was like, what are you doing? Like, this is the wrong message to be sending, you know? And, um, you know, I, I kind of didn't think about it. You know, early 20s, right? And, and uh, this was Wu-Tang. So if you knew Wu-Tang, it was like, that's Raekwon. What are you talking about? That's who he is, you know? Uh, we're not gonna gloss over that fact. And then I was like, but look inside the magazine, right? And inside the magazine, we had issues, we started exploring issues around uh, Giuliani's hyper-aggressive policing policies and the criminalization of young people. Um, we, we launched an article and a column that was about a dialogue between inmates and corrections officers because from our viewpoint, they were all locked up Right, so we wanted to foster an honest dialogue anonymously. Um, we were very specific and critical inside the magazine, and we wanted to do something that was bold and in your face, which is what young people do, right? Is you know, bold and in your face. Um, but there was an authenticity, and that's always what we were after, and I think that's what I hope to, to kind of build on, right? So we did the magazine, we did a lot of firsts aesthetically. I, I, could, I call what we did a, essentially a socio-political magazine that explored hip-hop culture. It wasn't just about real rap music, right? Um, we put Jay-Z on the cover. He, his first cover was with Just Magazine. That's a fact. Yeah. It was issue yeah. number two. Um, and it was called Keeping Rap Dollars in Rap Pockets. So our criticism and exploration around Jay was the fact that he was also a business person. And now that's kind of known in popular culture and he's looked upon that way and heralded but at the time, that was pretty radical, that he negotiated a deal, him and his partners, with the label where they kind of owned their own music. That was pretty radical. So we chose to focus on that. Uh, we also gave Eminem his first cover. That's a fact. That's true. Right? Jusky did the cover, and we did it like um, uh, Clockwork Orange. Right? So we gave him the top hat with the glass of milk and the, you know, and then, yes. And then Spin Magazine used that very same photo. To when they did their Eminem cover, and they got called out for it in the trade magazine. So I think we were pretty kind of on the edge in terms of how we were focusing and thinking and, and exploring uh, the culture, right? So along that time, I met an artist by the name of da Danny Hawk, and while I was in college, I had did some theater with some friends who were drama majors, and, uh, and then Danny and I, through the magazine, we supported one of his uh, solo performance plays, and, and we were like, you know, uh, if you're gonna come out with this thing and market it, market it like you're dropping an album. And at that time, you know, the CD thing was like, you know, people were selling a lot of records. So we were like, sell your, sell your play like you're selling a record. So he did a lot of college radio, a lot of street teaming. You know, we were in music stores, we did promos, and uh, that really helped kind of that particular production. And he was also in his 20s and, you know, made a lot of money. 
And then fast forward, you know, the year Stress Magazine made a million dollars is the year we went out of business, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there was something about infrastructure that I learned, something about business that way. It was a, it was a tough uh, nut to learn, right? You know, because you think, oh, wow, we finally made a goal, and, you know, it just kind of, kind of imploded, you know? Um, so that kind of, I took that, and I'm talking to Danny. He's like, well, I want to do this thing. I want to produce these artists. There's a lot of us around the country that are doing this work. And, uh, and then we jumped into uh, the Hip Hop Theater Festival. And that's how we met Will and a bunch of other people. And I think for me, it was always about telling our stories, mm -hmm. right, first and foremost. And I quickly kind of abandoned uh, any personal preference towards how that story was told as long as it was authentic and rich and really, really good and made a difference <laughs> in some way. And that's kind of what's driven me through this point. So, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily a, 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 an artist, but I consider myself a creative producer. And, you know, one of my heroes is Joseph Pat, for example, right? In terms of, uh, you know, what he was able to do in New York during a specific time. And I didn't have the privilege of knowing him, but I know plenty of people who knew him. You know, so I got to hear those kind of stories. So anyway, that's been my trajectory where I really, um, <clears throat> through my, the whole thing, has really been like trying to find the edge of the culture and push it, right? So another quick example of something we did was, uh, you know, Danny had gone to Cuba and learned about this big rap festival uh, called the Festival de Rap Internacional, and it happened in East Havana in this housing project called Alamad, right? Huge housing project, amphitheater, 3,000 people. And um, we went one year, and uh, I was sitting next to uh, a couple of people who um, were expats, right? And we'll leave it at that. And uh, we, we, there was this one group that came up uh, called uh, Primera Base, First Base. And uh, the hook on the song, and they were a very popular group. And they were, they, they were popular, and I was a little disheartened at that popularity because everything else I had seen was pretty radical. There were lots of duo, like male-female groups. At the time, we just had the Fugees, and that was it. And we saw like multiple female-male groups or female lead groups, and I was just really, I thought that was amazing, and I was really encouraged by that. Then this group comes out more traditional, right? You know, a lot of mug and a lot of love, and they were trying to obviously be something that they weren't. And the hit song was Igual Que Tu, Like You, right? Roughly translated. And, the, and so the hook was Igual Que Tu, Igual Que Tu, nigger, a nigger like you. That was the hook. And it was really, really bad for us mm -hmm. to hear that, right? Because there was no context for a bunch of young Cuban brothers to be using those words, you know? Um, and it was completely inauthentic, right? So that prompted us to then start organizing and bringing artists to the festival. And we brought a lot of artists to that particular festival. Most, uh, Talib, uh, Common, Tony Touch, Dead Prez, uh, and we were specific. So we would organize a concert in New York that was a fundraiser, and then we would bring um, artists to Cuba that participated in that particular concert. And we would raise a lot of money, and we would put the money into the productions themselves, and then also uh, some political prisoner funds. So we were doing activist work in the context of that thing, and we figured it out in terms of what we wanted to do. We developed a vision and a, cr and, and a strategy, and then we executed it. Uh, and that was pretty transformative. Um, so, you know, I, I keep trying to do that with the work. You know, whether it's hip hop at this point or just other work, you know, I, I follow a blueprint um, that works for me and my particular craft. I'm hoping that we can jump more into, and I think you might have some questions first to prompt us or, you know, my question might be for everybody, why are you here today? What are you hoping to learn? That's exactly the question I was going to ask. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys, uh, what brings you here? Anybody? Nice. <laughs> younger, my African-American heroes were like Malcolm X 
and Martin Luther King, just like my other heroes, uh, were John and Bobby Kennedy. And I, I think they all met a similar fate by a uh, corrupt government. And I just, you know, see, I don't know, a lot of self-absorbed behavior with artists across the board. And, and it really, uh, you know, to me, I would like to see a shift to, like, we all share the same concerns about the CIA, the NSA, social inequality, and, and you know, is that something that's addressed? You know, do, do you feel like, um, you know, showing compassionate side or a socially active side, <clears throat> you know, the, the only hip hop that I listened to really revolved around that, you know, KRS one. I don't know if I see the same thing now. I see, just give my personal opinion, more like a, you know, a, a self absorbed and selfish uh, attitude, like, I'll get mine the hell with the rest of whoever, frankly. And, and I would like. You know, my, my personal vision is to see that, you know, to champion intellect or compassion or social awareness. And I don't know how that travels along the lines of what you guys are doing, but, you know, that, that's always been my concern or desire is to see something different that, uh, you know, because we're all, you know, uh, we, we share, like, the same everything. And, you know, that I would like to see a shift in that direction. And it's a great, you know, like, I'll give a quick uh, story, you know, I was a coach, and I, you know, I'd be the basketball coach, and people would listen to me and not the teachers, you know, because I dunked the ball, or whatever, you know. And it's the same thing that I, I see, like, you, you guys have a way to get a, a voice out and a perspective to young people, and when it's displayed in you know, like a compassionate, intelligent way, it's like, well, that's kind of cool, you know. I grew up in a working class neighborhood where you talk about art or poetry, you're in a fist fight, you know. So we all deal with the same kind of nonsense <laughs> as men. And, you know, I, I just, I, my uh, desire was to see more of that, and I know you guys share that, that same vision, I would imagine, and just like, what's the working mechanism to get there, or is that, you know, like, uh, in, in any, especially with males, you know, to try to display that, that different way of, of, uh, of being for the good of all. I, uh, it's, it's, I, you know, I, I definitely don't have the, the definitive answer, but I, I hope to explore part of the answer with the young people that are here in the room based upon what your interests are and what you're looking to um, realize, right? Because I, I think, you know, I was, I was fortunate in that even though I grew up in enough, a rough neighborhood, the art that I was exposed to was right there on the street, right? And uh, it, was, it was accessible, always on the train, right? So, I, you know, the train would come by and we were able to follow stuff, like, and, and I think the accessibility has changed because you have access to media in a, in a completely different way. And the kind of artists that you referenced, the Karis Ones um, and, and some others, uh, they're still out there. They're not, uh, they're not propagated or popularized via the mainstream media or corporate mechanisms, but because you have the internet still as a neutral place, as a place that isn't restricted, quite yet, you know, um, you can get all of that stuff. You know, you could, you could see amazing art from all over the world, right? Um, you can hear amazing music from all over the world that's completely authentic, right? So I guess, my, you know, so uh, I, I'm really here because Mohenio asked us to be here and we want to explore a particular issue um, related to you guys. And I'm, and I'm hoping that um, we can get into that by just saying if we can answer some of your question in a real specific way related to y'all again, I think that would be uh, part of the answer. I just, real quick, I just want to echo that. I might go on a limb here, but I think there's more positive things going on with hip hop and youth empowerment mm -hmm. and stuff now than it was even with KRS and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. It's just, you don't hear about it as much. You know, like like this, this is an intimate gathering, it's going online, but whoever your equivalent would be in Oregon might not know this is happening, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I feel like a lot of those people that came of age in the late 80s, now they are the teachers and the leaders, you know, and there's a ton of them, mm -hmm. of hip hop artists, activists, doing just all kinds of work all over. So it's happening all over. It just, kind of like what Clyde said, it doesn't always seem like it because at that time, you know, KRS, Public Enemy, what have you, they tend to be some more of the more popular mainstream artists. Where I think, I think you're right in terms of the mainstream hip hop artists, maybe they're not <coughs> in turn on that, that vibe as much <coughs> now. You know what I mean? Uh, but uh, yeah. 
please. I'm interested to, uh, that y'all brought up social media. And earlier, Will, you were talking about how hip hop for you was a community gathering. And to me, when I think of theater, I think about people like this in the same space and time exploring community or these issues, right? So how has uh, social media as a platform, a neutral platform for accessibility, also impacted that idea of uh, community in person? Like, how has it been helping hip hop theater or hip hop culture? And how has it been, I guess, uh, taking away from it or being more harmful? Well, I, I would say just you guys are at an advantage in a way because I feel like you could, you know, have a freestyle session with cats in Europe, you know what I mean? Like live, you can, you can communicate in ways that we couldn't. When I was coming up in the early 90s, we, that, like I said, the real big push was to try to get signed to a major corporation because that was really the only way, really, outside of, you know, we could be local, but if we want to get our stuff out all over the world, there was no mechanism to do that, you know? And even local, like, you know, I used to uh, help run this, this nightclub um, in the Bay Area in the early 90s, and like, we used to sneak downtown to a friend of mine, give her all the flyers at, at her office job, and she would like run them through, you know what I mean? <laughs> and steal the posters, because there was no other way to get the word out. It seems so like archaic now, passing mailing lists around. So it's just, I think that the ability to get information out there is just really profound. If you have a voice that's really powerful and authentic, it's easy to get it, or easier, you know what I mean? The, the, the medium exists to get it out there. So I think, that's, I think that's really exciting. I think the challenge, we were talking about this last night, is just trying to retain the, the, the specialness and the sacredness of the live community gathering. And I think sometimes that can be really challenging for young people because it's not as much of a, a need, you know, it's all here often, you know what I mean? So a lot of times we, we, we can potentially miss out on these kind of interactions, which there's, some, there's, a, there's an energy underneath when people come to a theater show or a community gathering that's beyond even what's happening on the surface that we miss out if we just do the internet stuff, you know? So I think, you know, how do you maximize the technology, maximize the social media, and at the same time retain some of the, this kind of organicness too? That's where it's at for me. Shout out to one person in the back and then Carlos. Uh, yeah, I'm, I come from Minneapolis, and um, my, my uh, association with hip hop came through seeing artists that were of my generation and, and utilizing the technology they had in front of them, you know, like the, it, it seems like every 10 to 20 years there comes an art form that the older generation is mystified by. And, um, and they're using tools at their disposal. You know, you look at jazz, bebop, big band, rock. It was all people picking up things that were new, like an electric instrument. And like, I remember when turntables were people's trash. And so people picked them up and made them in a new thing. And uh, it seems like the, uh, that hip hop is, is ingrained in our culture, like punk rock, and even though people can't really admit it or acknowledge it in a lot of ways, unless it, you capitalize on it, mm -hmm. that as a cultural medium, it, um, it's continuing our exposure and our ability to, to transmit meaning, meaning through word, song, beat. Um, and uh, like I, I don't know if I have a question per se, other than uh, looking at, the next step, the next generation, I, I'm, I'm looking at, like, what, it, what are they going to come up with that mystifies us at this oh, point, no, wait, you know? No. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah, I'm yeah, looking forward too. to following, to be honest yeah. with you, you know, and supporting. You know, if, if I'm, if, you know, invested in any tenets, you know, uh, that I learned from, you know, the Universal Zulu Nation in Africa and Bambada, it's like each one teach one. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I th those are some things I live by that have, you know helped me survive, and that's one of them. You know, I know I don't have all the answers, mm -hmm. so uh, I, you know, I'm I'm definitely <coughs> ready to fall in line when the time is right. You know, authenticity. I'm looking, but you know, it goes back to that. It goes. This I want to say this. It goes back to authenticity. Like I feel like with hip hop or whatever the next thing is gonna be. You know. For you young people here, like what is the, whether you're an, a, a lyricist, a musician, a filmmaker, or whatever, you know, what is the Asheville style? Mm, yeah. Right. Or, now, you know, Western Mass style. Right. Now, yeah, the Western, Western Mass style. Now, listen, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. The four, the four, the four, was it 413? 
413 stop. Now listen, <laughs> listen, I know that sounds crazy, but again, I'm trying to tell you, when I was coming up in the 80s to be an MC to, from California, it was like, you know what I mean, California, this is pre, it's before Dre, before all that stuff. You know what I mean? So it's like, you'll never be able to imitate Brooklyn like people from Brooklyn. I do a lot of youth work with this kind of thing. I do a lot of work with hip hop artists, a lot of work with theater artists internationally. And a lot of times I'll be, like I said, I'll be in South Africa or Europe and they're like, yo, son, I'm coming up Brooklyn. I'm like, okay, let's just, you know what I mean? <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's, it's natural initially when you're into something to imitate. That's natural. You're gonna go through a certain period of imitation as a young artist. But then how do you get that authentic voice to not necessarily just talk about things locally, but to capture an aesthetic and an essence yes. that is that is the es that is. the essential thing of who wh what your community right. is and who you are. If you ever listen to like you know like old school Ice Cube or Too Short, even me from the Fillmore in San Francisco, you know my work is if you're from there, you can really get a certain. It's like it epitomizes a certain segment of the history and culture of. That place. Of, of that place, you know what I mean? It, and it's like, I, and I know, you know, I grew up there, you know, so it's like I know the stories and, and, and I can articulate in a certain way that kind of epitomizes that energy. I've I come in essence, the storyteller or griot of that area. Not just me, but that's one element. There might be a gangster element that's more the harder element, you know? How do, how do you do that? And like, that is the thing. What does it mean? What is the musicality of Asheville? What is the... What is the energy? What are the local idioms? And then how do you fuse that in with hip hop? And that's where you not only get that authenticity, but that's where you get the respect worldwide. Right. Because people are like, they're doing something that they, it epitomizes that energy, that energy in Western Massachusetts. Like Steve is the, you, you, you know what I mean? Of course. That, you know, the Sly Stone in the late 1960s, you know, mm -hmm. the, the San Francisco, that was the San Francisco, that was, that was hate Ashbury, that was that. Does that make any sense? So, and I said, it's not something that's the easiest thing to do overnight. It's not the easiest thing to like, you know, okay, I'm going to make it up right now. But it's just being open to that energy and continue to articulate national and international issues, but then also looking locally. Because hip hop ultimately, even though it's a global phenomenon, really at its core, it's a neighborhood functioning it's hyper local. music form. It's hyper local. Even Jay Z, he's talking about his neighborhood where he grew up. And he's doing it in a way that has universal appeal to people all, all over. But it's the storyteller. The essence of it, at least for the music bar, is the storyteller within her or his community. You know what I mean? Using the local to look at issues globally. You know, so you're talking about police brutality, you're talking about locally in your neighborhood, but then other people are getting it. So and, you know, that's true of dance too. There, there's so many regional dance forms, you know, that uh, that are that are contemporary. You know, breaking is old. It's still very popular. It's on television. There's lots of battles and competitions all over the world. You know, yeah. um, but when you look at Chicago, when you look at New Orleans, when you look at uh, the West Coast, you know, all those forms are 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 reinterpretations of a very ancient need to move our bodies and to kind of tell our stories physically. You know what I'm saying? And that, you know, so whether young people know it or not. They're still connected right. to something that's very ancient and deep, right. and it's the disconnection, mm -hmm. right? To your point, uh, sir, that you know is I think part of what we we want to foster more, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why I think it's we need to be open as older elders it's just to connect and say, hey, I'm not trying to tell you what it is, but you know, let me show you this, right? Because it looks a lot like what you're doing, just just so that you know whether you choose to do something with it or not. You make that connection if you choose to. Yeah, but and just, just just real quick, just to piggyback onto that, and I think it's a deep thing. Like, you ever see, like, traditional folk dances where they're like, hey, now we're so in the seeds, we're so in the seeds. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's just things that come out of the experience. And it's the same thing with hip-hop hip dances. It's really deep. Like, you know, like you said, hip-hop was created in New York, but some of the, like, the popping, which is, like, this stuff, and the locking was West Coast. So all this stuff, the way it came from California. No duh. You know what I mean? So all that stuff, that didn't come from Brooklyn. All this stuff, that came from... That was, that was California, you know what I mean? Um, and even within that, there's like popping, like in the Bay, I'm just saying, in the Bay Area. Will really wants to pop. No, I'm not gonna pop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna pop. But in the Bay Area, for example, I'm not gonna do it, there's this kind of a line dance. Just, hey, 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 hey. There's, a, there's, hold on. there's a line dance, you know, where it's kind of like, you know, I do that, you know, then you do it, you know what I mean? And three people do it, and then we kind of like, it's kind of like a, it's kind of almost like a, Kind of a jack jack in the box kind of kind of dancing style, you know what I mean? All these kind of cats doing this thing, and I found out where it came from was this dance group called the Black Resurgence, 
and they were the Black Panther Party's dance group. <laughs> and so they would come out and they would do like kind of march, you know, like mm -hmm. pre-S1W type right. stuff. And out of that, the brothers in the 80s later on started doing like hip hop style dances that were, you know. But it came out of a specific local political movement, movement meaning political movement, but also dance movement that these black resurgence did. And then they, the brothers copied that and created that, you know what I mean? So all this stuff of agriculture or the way people move here. How do you turn those into dance moves? I know that sounds crazy. I'm not saying like a hip hop cow, you know. Yeah. Style, but, but, but I'm saying, I'm saying it could be, you know, like, you know, I don't know. You know what I, mean? so, I don't know. But the point is, that is the authenticity I'm talking about. Physically, aesthetically, reaching into that locally and creating art from that. You know, that could be what it's at. Uh, sister, back in. Thanks. Um, I'm curious about uh, the historical knowledge that current like practitioners of hip hop have you know like and if how that relates to authenticity because i feel like it's so specific to the historical context that it developed in and every sort of like stage along the way especially complicated by the mainstream appropriation and it changes the meaning of what hip hop is um yeah just about like i didn't know that about the black panthers it makes sense but is that commonly known? Like where the roots and routes of, of these these things go? It's a really, really great uh, point, right? Because I know uh, <coughs> with a couple of the forms, right? Uh, let's say with, with breaking, you know, just as, as one form or dance in general, uh, because it's in your body, right? It's primarily oral. So it's like oral based uh, knowledge sharing. And it's very master apprentice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and visual arts are like that too. So oftentimes, and you, you know, the story, it's like I started practicing. So and so took me under their wing and then gave me an outline, mm -hmm. right? And I started looking at these folks and I hooked up with so and so and then they gave me an outline, right? So um, the, rec the recorded, the music is different. You know, there's a lot of scholarship around the music. There isn't a whole lot of scholarship around the visual arts or in graffiti uh, and dance. Joe Sloss wrote this book, uh, Dr. Joe Sloss, C H S C H L O W S. Sloss wrote this book called The Foundation, and he really did an excellent job. Uh, he's he's a he's like a musicologist by training, so he did a really good job of breaking down like the science of breaking. And uh, he managed to do it without pissing anybody off, <laughs> which, uh, which was quite a feat. He didn't get beat up, he didn't get threatened, none of that stuff, which usually happens, you know, because the, 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 the elders who do have kind of like the knowledge and, you know, they hold on to it. And they don't, not everybody's uh, giving because they've been exploited, you know, so they kind of, they, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you don't just give it up, right? They're like Kung Fu masters, you know? You gotta prove yourself. So, uh, there's more scholarship work to be done by, yeah. by, by, by far, I think. Yeah, know? yeah, I would say there is a lot out there, but I would also say that by the time some of those books started being written, the beginnings of the forms were already done. You know what I mean? True. So some of those people are still alive, but it's almost like they, were, they weren't, there was no scholars kind of chronicling so there's even, there's even disagreement in New York about who created what, you know what I mean, this kind of stuff, because it kind of was happening, you know, and so it's kind of like there's a lot that we don't know, even though it's a modern art form, just because people were doing it. Does it make any sense? People weren't necessarily kind of kind of reflecting on it yet. Yeah, nobody By the time that happened, even if it started happening in the late 70s, that was already when it was already created. Rennie Harris produces a great festival in Philadelphia called the Legends Festival, where it is a forum for that kind of knowledge sharing mm -hmm. to happen in practice. But the important piece for not ready, and I, it's that it's embedded in practice. It's, it's like there's also this, this schism between the practitioners and the scholars because it is very much a one-way sort of relationship. It doesn't have to be, but oftentimes it is, and that causes a division. Uh, here and then back here. And Clyde after I get some. And then we got some. Okay, great. So many uh, great points are being called up, and I wanted to sort of contribute uh, part of a story that really pertains to all this, to authenticity, to uh, regional style, uh, to the ebb and flow of, of how people even create their craft. Um, I go so far back that my contemporary sound was the last poets. 
that's, you know, and, and, and their connection even to the Panthers and to that whole time period. Um, I'll just let, the, if there are young folks in the room, I guess that means me, I'm representing the old folks in the room, and that's good. Um, connecting the 60s in this tumultuous time, it, was, it wasn't just a time of poetic awareness. It was dangerous, it was in your face, it was brutality, there were deaths, Kent State, do I need to say more? But in all this, um, I entered this circle as a musician, and so to me, the, the, the big arm wrestle was over music and world music. And so that interest took me to West Africa, and suddenly, in, as I'm there for the, for the music and the jazz and the connection, suddenly I see young hip-hop uh, things happening. And what I realize is that there's a lot of imitators, it's all Brooklyn, in West Africa, and suddenly there are a few who are the griots, the contemporary griots. So if we're going back to the ancient, it's pretty much about as ancient as you can get, the storytellers of, of Africa. And these young folks are you now. They're you. I, I see it in them. And I've had the great pl pleasure and privilege to work with a lot of these young folks. One group was called Gokbi System, Neighborhood System. How much more can you get? And what they did was they integrated ancient, almost forgotten West African string instruments with traditional drums. And then it was all in your face. I knew just enough Wallaf to understand they weren't, they were saying their own unique story. And eventually they taught me, and, and so here I am, the world musician guy, you know, world music thing, and here they are, the latest, latest, and I say, let's bring them to America. Mm -hmm. So they get here, and I, I pile up a pile of CDs and go, look, welcome to America, here's a little booklet to take you somewhere. So it's Miles Davis, oh yeah, they heard of that. Pharaoh Sanders, mm, not so sure. Uh, John Coltrane, heard but don't know. Last Poets, oh, we know them. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. No, this is underground. You're, you're from Africa. I mean, you're good, you're sharp, you're knowledgeable, you're all that. You cannot know the last post. This isn't, that ain't even right. They're, they're laughing at me. Their English is basic, and finally they say, you know, I dare them. Well, fine, who are the last poets? Go ahead. And they go, first rappers. You know, I go, the judges will accept that answer because they had it. They knew what they were doing. And, and I said, how do you know them? They said, well, if, we, if we're going to really enter something, then we have to know how it starts. Wow. So you have partners in this world like that? Yeah, yeah. And, and then, there, you know, group after group. But these, were, these guys were ridiculed. What are you doing? This is Bush. You're calling up the old, like you're bringing a banjo to, get to, to, to jazz? Well, yeah. You can bring anything there. So they took some ferocious heat and did it anyway. And so well, I guess what I want to say is that this is a world phenomenon. And, and while at first some of the less daring copied what they saw, that, I agree, well, that, you copy, that's a great place to start. Yep. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you go, I think I know what's going on, all the rest has to be you. And uh, I love what these young folks did. And so here they were at my house, literally, watching MTV. And they're sort of fascinated. They're tilting their heads kind of funny. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, look, whatever else you remember from what I say, I'm just going to say one thing that, that's useful. MTV needs you more than you need MTV. <laughs> and they just sort of laughed, and, and, but now, now we know. And, and these cats are doing it now, right now. And it's men and women, it's all this you're talking about. So you have some international brothers and sisters, and, and please, make this link, because if global citizenship is going to save us, and really that's what's going to happen, you know, not protect America, protect the planet, mm -hmm. these cats are on, and you're on to them, and this is, this is so good. We're going to go to Nick back here, and then we're going to go to some of the questions we have uh, via Howra. Two questions for you guys, which yeah. is one's about style and one's about function, which is uh, just in exploring and learning how to play uh, musical folk traditions. Um, I hear a lot of, uh, of my elders saying, please don't record this when you're learning it. And they were making the point that when they used to learn songs that pre-radio, they would go to the dance. And the only way to learn the song was to take back what you could remember of it. Mm. And then the accidents and the ways in which mm. you would put it together became your own style. Mm. So I have a question about how to grab an authentic style when you have the internet and you're watching things always to get your information in an isolated context, especially a rural context. Mm. And then what, the other one was for Will, which you said it started because it had a specific function for you, mm. personal function. And then you saw it have a social function. Clyde, where you were living. And I, I have a question too, is like, 
where what happens when this work doesn't have a social function or a function mm -hmm. and it's just being done as a uh, mm -hmm. it, that, that's a, that, I'll leave it I don't I don't know that many hip hop artists whether mainstream or or community driven that it didn't at the beginning have some kind of social function that have longevity. Mm -hmm. I know some hip hop artists that came out and it was more like, you know, yeah, I'm doing a rap thing, you know, they have like one hit. But yeah. the mainstream artists, all the ones, even the big popular ones, Jay Z, you know, Kanye, they talk about that a lot, that it was a social function. You know what I mean? For for them. You know, survival, getting out the game, uh, communicating with other boroughs, you know what I mean? So I think it's all, it always has that for the most part. I mean, again, it, there have been some commercial things, but I think it always has that in some kind of way. It doesn't have to be the same kind of, or same kinds of commercial functions, you know? Um, I think it's always been that. And the, the other part, you want to answer the other? Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's tough for me to answer, Nick, because I'm not built that way, you know what I mean? So it's even hard for me to kind of like, step outside and say, well, and, and, and not be crass even, you know? Um, I think uh, w when it doesn't have a social function in, in, with respect to music, right, you, you end up with minstrels yeah. that that's like sell a lot of records mm -hmm. and do a lot of damage, <coughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I hate to just be down on it, but that's the only... Uh, but that thing, and that, that also doesn't have longevity. I mean, how many yeah. of you guys have heard, heard of Candyman? No one knows who that is, right? Candyman? No? He was huge in 1991. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't born in 1991. <laughs> that's, but that's my point. That's my point. The people that you know from back in the day or even now are the ones who it comes out of that community social function. They might not, they might not define it that way, but that's what it is. Yeah, me and my boys, to, to stay sane, we would freestyle. You know what I mean? And we would freestyle against other neighborhoods. And like, that's a social community function. That's a survival aspect. You know what I mean? The ones that didn't do that, it's more like, it's been more menstrual. We're gonna, we're gonna jump online real quick and get to Carlos. And then I saw a hand up over here. So, so we'll, go, we'll address some, some of our folks who are participating in the stream, Carlos, and then it's your sister over here. There's a, there's, a, there's a few comments coming from online. I'll just uh, pass one of the, uh, a, a question or, or a, um, uh, I don't, can't think of the word. Um, Javier Benavente, she's uh, from Chile. She lives in Western Massachusetts. She writes, I'm really interested in how the power of hip hop is expressed in rural contexts and in international or transnational contexts, which that question could be also for, me, for you guys, but also could be for, for some of you guys who uh, live in a rural place, even if it's Greenfield, uh, and some of you even come from other countries. So how is hip hop expressed in a rural or from an international place that that's the if that's how you understand it or if that's where you're from Somebody, anything else in there that you want to uh, put out there yeah. and then we'll go over to uh i want to hear from yeah, yeah this is over here there's something also unrelated about uh wanting to hear about how women and their contributions uh to hip-hop culture and hip-hop theater uh wanting to hear some of that okay great um so can we hear from you and then Carlos, we can go to you. Is that cool? Well, you touched on a lot that I'm very sensitive about. Um, I live in Greenfield. I've been there for about five years. I moved from Vermont. Um, hip hop and that whole culture has really changed my life. It's very prevalent in Greenfield. It's a big thing. Everybody's bumping music down the street and you know, we all have our favorite jams. Um, a lot of what I've noticed recently is that it has become all about the media, all about the paycheck, all about the money and the image. And um, you're talking about how um, you put him on the cover with the blunt and the bulletproof vest and he had this big image. And um, that's what's being portrayed now. And I see a lot of this happening in Greenfield and Franklin County with people my age, with friends that I know. Heroin very prevalent and it's taking over massive amounts and um, I see it reflected in the communities and I, see, I hear it in the songs. I just went to a Hobson concert not too long ago. They had a couple of local artists ripping 413, 413, put your hands in the air. It's just, it's become a big party scene. I feel like the music in Massachusetts, at least for some of the people that went up on the stage that I saw locally, Every single song he started with, put your hands in the air, I'm doing girls and doing drugs and not getting caught by the cops. And it's become 
this facade of I can get away with whatever I want, I'll be okay, and like, I just, I feel like it has no meaning anymore, and to me, hip hop has always been a story. Every music, any type of art is always expressing emotion, story, to get something across to somebody else, and it has none of that for me anymore, in the mainstream media at least, and I just, it, it hurts because it's, it, art to me is a beautiful thing, and I feel like it's not art anymore. Okay. This is where the opportunity is. Yeah, you know, you know, almost every music form is a response to something else. Every theater, but we were just talking about the regional theater movement was a response to Broadway and how that was not addressing the needs of communities nationally. The regional, you know what I mean? Hip hop was a response because at that time, on the radios and stuff like that, the the the, the it was not reflecting disco, disco and stuff. It was not reflecting what was going on in the communities. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity is, how can you all? I, how can you, as a, a, a supporter, as an audience member, as an artist, how can you then say, well, how do, what do we want to create that's a response to this bogusness that's happening? You know, you know what I mean? And for, according to you, I'm not saying it's bogus. I'm saying what, what you're saying, you know? It's a response. Does that make any sense? Hip-hop theater was a response to that. There were, there were, on stage, there were no, I wasn't seeing anything that was reflecting what was going on in my community, in my generation, you know? And so it's, it was, it was, if there was people doing it, I probably wouldn't have done it because it was no need. It's already done well. You know what I mean? So artists, that's, that's part of our responsibility. It's your responsibility to respond and be like, okay, I don't like that. You know what I mean? So you don't have to necessarily diss it. You can, but say, okay, well, what am I going to create? Because chances are, if you feel this way, there's a like-minded community in this area that feels the same way. You know, I don't think you're the only one feeling that. So how do you galvanize that community to create something new? This was the first time I've ever experienced anything like a conversation, like straight up about hip hop, about this in a community. Like, I go to school with Eugenio, and he told me about this, and th that's why I'm here because it's about the community, it's yeah. about talking about it. And like, I've never experienced this, and like, up until recently, I've been kind of trying to get out there and experience different cultural yeah. things and like do different things, experience different things. And like, I've never had an opportunity to actually sit down and say, I don't like that this is happening and like how do I change it but right. me now is figuring out how to change it and how to push the boundaries and how to get there because like there, there's the the marshmallows LP, LP2 just came out and that for me is changing a lot of the hip-hop game that just like made me smile when it yeah, came yeah, out yeah. because it's just everything has the same beat and same drop and it's yeah. it does it. Yeah. but you know but you, it doesn't that doesn't <laughs> yeah. that doesn't it changed it i understand i mean this is more i want to know how i can yeah change we it. can go into practical stuff but you can start small you guys can start with like a weekly or you know what i mean two you know and once every two weeks you get together you play music together you know what i mean write rhymes or just yeah. discuss it could be you put together a party that's you know yeah. i don't know what you call you know what i mean once a yeah, month yeah. you put together and that plays music that you are more conducive you know you can be active in that way. You guys, one thing you do have a lot of people, you have space. There's a lot of space here. You know what I mean? That's just an asset. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's an asset. That's a plus. Right. You know, so you got space here. You can find yeah. the space to, to do stuff. You can do a, like, you can do a generational thing where the older people come down, younger people, and like, when you're bringing your hip hop music, they're bringing their jazz, and you do a, like a weekly jam session just to see what, what is out there. Like, those kind of things will spark new, new things. And I, 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 you're not alone in how you feel. I guarantee it. I put money on it. You're not alone mm -hmm. as a young person in this community about maybe you have a frustration with some things, mm -hmm. right? So the thing is, how do you tap into that and just start? The uh, 60s were not. The 60s were not. You know, universal wave of resistance. It's probably somebody knows the percentage. It was a small percentage of people, and the rest, and the rest of the music was just grooving along, doing whatever. And whatever isn't was never remembered, and the rest of it is. Right. You said slide in the family stone. Yeah, there we are. Right. right. That was a that was a commentary. It stuck. Yeah. The last poets. That stuck. Uh, you know, the rest of it uh, disappeared. So your your sense of it's just me out here. Yeah, in the '60s, that's how it felt to a big chunk. Yeah. Same same challenge. You know, stand up and just you know grab the wheel, drive the car where you want to go. Um, I just want to say that um, as I'm listening, I'm listening to a lot of, uh, I'm hearing you guys talk about what was happening, what, like, what was happening in the hip hop was, like, pertained to where it was coming from, and what was happening where you guys are from. So I want to just talk about, like, what is happening around here? What, what do we got? Well, for me, it's, it's about access. Like, you can't get anywhere if you don't have a car. Yeah. And if you don't have a car, you, you still gotta, if you have a car, you still gotta get gas. So, like, it's, it's one problem after another one. And then who are you gonna meet up? Because nobody answers the 
fucking phone anyway. <laughs> 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 Well, when we get together, right, we freestyle, right? We freestyle, we freestyle. Just right there. Like, <laughs> but, like, and then, like, I mean, it's hard to get get together around here. And, like, when we get together, we're, I can understand, like, that's our release, our party, you know? Like, we want to have fun. You know, we came all the way out here, well, let's just, like, you know, light up a fire, like, outside. Or, like, you know, so there is a lot of space, but it's a lot of emptiness, too. There's a lot of like isolation happening. But that's the thing that we gotta change, man. It's bring it yeah. together. Yeah. Think about all the Express things it. that are filled within that space. Yeah. So I mean, who here is doing stuff with hip hop? So raise your hands. See a raise your hands. Let's see him. Yeah. Hi though. Hi. Not what? halfway. Hi. <laughs> what? Are, what are you? What are we doing? I'm part of a local hip hop group, kind of up and coming. It's me and a good friend of mine. Two years ago, two friends of ours from the tech, or from the Franklin County Tech School over in Turner's, had decided they wanted to start doing their own thing. They didn't want to label themselves as hip hop. They wanted to label themselves as indie hip hop. They don't think that their actual hip hop or you view today is like the Lil Wayne's, the Rick Ross, the Birdman, all of them. They wanted their own type of style which kind of originates from Hoodie Allen, g Easy, Mod Son, and that kind of inspired me and a buddy of mine, who we have both been writing, me since, I'm 18, I've been writing since I was 13, he's 20, and he's been writing since he was about 13, 14, decided we wanted to do our own thing, and our, our two buddies wanted to help us out, and we've decided we have our own inspirations, and. We have some of them are the mainstream artists like Eminem, person, for a personal one of mine is T.I., but then a lot of the underground artists, some of them that have been making their names quite known, um, Tech Nine being a big one, Chris Calico, Chris Webby, um, and they kind of inspired us to want to do something of our own thing, <coughs> and what we've actually done is we've created more of an inspirational hip hop group. We have, we actually had just recently back last month put out our demo on SoundCloud and some of the songs that were supposed to be more of either the ones that hit home, the ones that are inspirational, or the ones that are the good vibes, like positive energy, those are the ones that people say like, hey, we really like the song, we really like the song. We performed at the, um, the Roadhouse in Miller's Falls back in the end of December and we had, uh, it, we probably, performed in front of 150 people and we ended up getting a standing ovation first time performing on stage and they liked what we did and we've even got planned that we're already working on future work both as a group and as solo artists right. and we're actually going to be performing again uh, next month one of them one of the bands performing alongside us being the runner-up contestant in battle of the bands for warp tour last year being sienna and potentially we might be playing with the, t the band that beat them beneath the sheets. And it's performing both hip hop and rock, saying like, hey, motivation comes not just from, hip hop is this whole genre of singing, dancing, rap, like hip or rapping, all this. And then to be able to incorporate that with the rock world where that's a lot of stories, they address a lot of problems, like mm -hmm. some bands that do it very well all, or of all different genres, Offspring, Rise Again, Surge Tank, and the System of a Down. And it's basically being able to intertwine both of them, saying how our rock and hip hop the same, that's kind of inspired us to drive and keep <coughs> wanting to do what we do, keep being able to have people be inspired, not exactly make it big, but at least be able to say that, hey, we have a word, we have, we have what we want to say, we still want to have fun while doing it, but we want to get our message out and there's positive reviews, we're not trying to be like the next Young Money, Cash Money superstars <coughs> or the next Shady Record superstars. We're trying to take what we're doing independently and even if it's just we're state known and actually have people say, hey, there's all this stuff going around in like New York where you've, or in uh, the West Coast where it's all gangster rap or then you've got down south where there's like crunk and stuff with Lil John and everything have New England be its own thing mm -hmm. and be more than just all that. I mean, just me, me my buddy, and then our two friends, it's a, basically an independent hip, or a um, motivational hip hop group and a hippie hop group. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the best way to put it. Happy-go-lucky stoners, just <laughs> saying good vibes. Yeah, it's, 
yeah. try to intertwine, like saying that there's a lot more to what there actually is right. behind it. Right. That's awesome. That's interesting. I would, I, <laughs> just to you know interject, you know, I, I uh, practice generosity. I don't think I need to say that, but I think that's an important kind mm -hmm. of like, in you know, successful kind of thing. Like, put people on, right? So you know, that's that's definitely something I practice, where it's like. I try to be as generous as possible and say, oh yeah, you like what we do, you know, well, you know, oh man, Will Power is amazing, or you should really know, you know, or I'm doing this thing, come with me, you know, you should check it out. Um, and I think in that, um, you know, constantly be advocates for yourselves and, and, and who you represent. So advocacy also, like being as vocal as possible. And like we've had people come to us saying like, hey, we want to do stuff with you, we want to do stuff with you, and me and my friend have actually sat down and we're sitting there thinking it's, we're, as much of a hobby as this is, we're really trying to be serious about this, and we want to make sure that you, if you want to do something with us, you're as serious as we are, where we may be all fun and games outside, but as soon as it comes time to stand in front of a microphone, it's all jokes aside, time to be serious. And we want to make sure that whoever we're talking to, and we have some friends that are great local MCs that we want to work with, and we know they have the dedication, and we have some people that are we know we want to joke around, and it's basically biting our lip, like, we really need to see if you're dedicated or not. Absolutely. Amen. Amazing. I love the idea of a New England sound. What about you, man? What you working on? Uh, I manage a couple rappers from like, around here. Uh, one is, goes to UMass, his name's Danny, and the other one lives in Turner, his name's Terrence. Uh, That's cool. Yeah. So you try, try to get a gig? Yeah, yeah, like I set up shows. I mean, personally, I want to rap too eventually, but, yeah. you know, I got to work on it a little bit, so. <laughs> <laughs> but they're actually really good. They couldn't make it. I wanted to bring them, but. Uh, I like, hip-hop basically is my life. Like, I don't know where I would be without it, honestly, like. And like touching on points about them being uh, the money and stuff. If you come from where like a lot of these people come from, it's completely like different. It's hard to explain. Like life is just completely different. Like I I'm adopted, so like and I grew up here my whole life. But recently I just went with my like met my biological family, and it's like completely different life to them. So like with the music and stuff, I don't know. Like they're looking for different things. Like money to them is so much bigger than like I even could even imagine like and like the selfishness like they honestly like they're only looking out for, they're looking out for themselves for a reason because nobody really want is looking out for them they feel so that's where like a lot of the selfishness comes from where a lot of these artists like that's where it is like when you see them being egotistical and selfish to them that's just them creating for themselves and uh, oh and then earlier I heard someone talking about social media and how, if you're not authentic, how do you like get that authentic authenticity? Or, I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, authenticity. But realistically, with the social media, there's so many, so many people trying to do it now. You're not gonna get seen unless you're authentic. Like people, like like I'll, all the videos I look at, like I'll just if I don't think like right off like the first ten <coughs> seconds, if it's not something that stands out to me, I'll just skip to the next one. Like literally, I go through like probably 50 different new songs a day. I go on How to Do Hip Hop and just look up rap songs. Like that's what I like to do. And like if it's not appealing to me right away, I'm not gonna waste my time listening to that. There's so much more. Like there's like millions of songs honestly that get dropped every day. Mm -hmm. And authenticity yeah. will always rise out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The question that I had was ad somehow addressed, but then after I hear you now, Jaguar, right? Uh, and I heard you, I, I want to deepen it, because I think that, or my question to you guys, not for me, I, I came from a city, Buenos Aires, which has similarities to New York and other ones, where you need to be really smart to, to get away and mm -hmm. get out of it. Mm -hmm. So you're mostly escaping for a long time. Here, it seems that the form of art that you all are facing and the big challenge is how do you get together <laughs> instead of getting away. Uh -huh. So in that, and, and this is my question to you, how do you get together? And this is not, hop, you know, not hopping into a car and getting to, how do you get together? Through technology, mostly. But no, I know, but how do you get together in person? School. 
But like, what happens when we get together? Yeah. We sit in the study room and we talk, and then we talk about different issues, whether it's about hip hop or about but classes. Is, is it, yeah, is, whatever. whatever. Is there any possibility for you to get together differently? We need to be able to put ourselves outside of that study room and make it more public no, because we're behind closed space. doors. Yeah, because we're behind closed doors. Hmm. We need to be able to put it out. We only have like a specific group that we can share similarities with, like. We can't really, or we haven't been able to like find other people, even though there are a bunch of them out there. Mm. It's just hard to like bring us all together. Mm. I guess figuring out who we would want to bring together is most of the issue because, well, if we don't have a space at school, we can sit in a park or whatever. But, but it's, it's also about big, quality. Yeah. Yeah, it's about who you bring, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's about figuring out who you want there and who you don't. Yeah, because I really don't want to hang out with a crackhead over there. Like, yeah. like, I'm going to teach you something though. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, they can't. They, they have a lot Just of... Just don't smoke. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you know what I mean? So, that's the other thing. Sometimes you can find people that are maybe aesthetically different than what you... You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I mean, you want, you don't want anyone disruptive, but just be open to it. It might not look the same way. You know, y'all yeah. might not dress the same, or, you know, but it might still be some linkages there. You know? It's... No. So it's like how, how you get together, but also then uh, what are you doing when you get together, like the what part of it, right? And are you making something or are you, are you pushing yourself to something. kind of go outside of that comfort zone? Because that could become a little bit of a, a bubble, right? Where you just kind of connect and you don't... So how do you kind of say, all right, now we're going to stick our necks out and try to do this thing and see if it works? when you do kind of develop a consensus around a vision to do something. I think that sounds like y'all are in, almost at the cusp of that place where like the focus needs to get to, all right, so now we're going to organize a thing and we're going to see where that goes from there. And there's enough of you here. And you know, so impediments aside, right, in terms of uh, the, the resources or the lack thereof, right, yep. from the car, the gas, and those things, um, focus on what you do have. Right? And then start from there. Right? I, I mean, you know, it, which might not be a lot, but a lot of people have done, have jumped off that way. Yeah. You know? Um, so we have somebody back here and then somebody in the back. Over here and over here. I'd like to, uh, I'm another one of the older people in the room, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, just jumping on to what Carlos is talking about. Um, uh, we have a theater in uh, southern Vermont. Uh, we're a presenter. And uh, so I think I'd like to just uh, throw into the conversation what the role of public space plays. Faith in, in hip hop culture and a lot of interest in hip hop culture, but has there ever been a moment where that has sort of been tested, where there's been like a song or an artist who just made me like, why, why um, does this belong in the culture? How have you sort of <laughs> regained your, your focus and belief in that? Like, I'm just, I'm curious about this. Um. Probably too numerous examples <laughs> to focus on. That's my short answer. Uh, but let's let's try to uh, keep things moving. Any other? And and I, I know the online thing. There was a couple of questions about women in theater or in the hip hop theater movement. Yeah. And you know I have to say that you know the idea to to pull the festival together. Uh, I don't think was original because there was already work happening in the UK. Uh, you know, Holly Bass had written an article in American Theatre Magazine. Uh, she's a longtime friend and colleague. And Issa Davis, who is a very accomplished playwright and actor, wrote an article in The Source called Hip Hop Theatre New Underground. And that's where I saw these names like Will Power and Hip Hop Theatre Junction. And, and that gave us the, the idea to do the thing. So. You know, uh, and you know, my longtime collaborators in addition to Danny and Camilla Forbes, uh, who was a powerhouse director, um, found the Hip Hop Theater Junction. You know, she's working on Broadway right now, uh, uh, associate directing a piece. So uh, I think one of the things I enjoy about my work on the theater side is, and hip hop in general, but you know, hip hop brought me to this place, but theater in particular, not so much the industry stuff, the commercial stuff, but this space is the inclusiveness <coughs> and the uh, equitability. So I want to, you know, also put that out there as a thing for you guys to continuously practice with each other. You know, um, that, that makes me want to sort of ask in really explicit terms because I think the question about how 
the hip hop culture is connects in a rural place, how it connects to those in a, in, who, 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 who hover in a transnational you know, place. What are the, what are the, what are the, the essential aspects? What are the pieces of hip hop culture that are in the spirit of it, right? That, that are so important in, or become important in a, in a rural place, for those of you growing up in a rural place, or in, in, and for those of you who didn't, but who are practitioners, how does it land for somebody growing up in a rural place? What are the, what are the essential explicit pieces of it that are meaningful? You talk about the, the intimacy or the equity that takes place in, in, in it. So is this question yeah. explicit and clear? My question I would ask in addition is, oh, are there any aspects that don't apply, you know? Because I feel like, you know, hip hop is poetry, it's, it's metaphor. So even if you're not living next to the projects, maybe you are, there's something metaphorically in there that oftentimes connects to what people are going on rurally, how they feel isolated, you know what I mean? It yes, but that's not, that, I mean, I, this is a great point yeah. because it, it's different for, 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 for people. I mean, it's not. It's different in terms of how they they they, they take it. They might. I, I I mean, I know for some of you, poetry, right? Nico and I were talking about this. My son here loves hip hop, right? Loves the, the the wholeness of it, the multitude of it. Poetry it wouldn't be identifiable necessarily, in in that. So what? It, so it, how it's how how do we understand it through a, a specific to to the hip hop culture? I, I'm not saying that it's not poetry. I, I, I believe that it's a mostly a, a, how it gets differentiated and, and how it gets. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like I said, for me, it's just, yeah. For me, it's like it's metaphor. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's metaphor. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's why for me, I'd be interested like in what you're saying. And also, are there elements that don't connect? Because, you know, I'm not from New York, but there's never been an artist I've heard who's good that don't connect with all the elements. I might, I may or might not, not know where the L train rides, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I can connect it to something because the metaphor is deep. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are artists today, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of the music, you know, because I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm very, there's artists that are 19 years old, you know, that are young, that I, you know, for all, uh, for all intents and purposes, I, I shouldn't be related to, but it's good music and it's good art, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and um, I'm into it, so I listen to it. I mean, last night I was, I was putting Will on, you know, I was like, yo, check out this, so boom, we nice. were on YouTube, and I was like, yo, Peep Abso, you know, he's down with Kendrick, boom, you know, and I was, uh, Joe Badass, you know, I was just kind of throwing things at him to live, you know, um, that were speaking to some, you know, part of the conversation, so I'm very much, but I've always been that kind of person, you yeah. know what I mean, in terms of just going out, uh, I, it's tough, Matthew. I don't know, I mean, you know, how to answer that question in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't. But I just feel like it's like, like again, the piece yesterday, right? I wasn't around in the '30s and '40s and '50s. You know what I mean? The piece you guys did, but there's an energy underneath that is true. Mm -hmm. That I connect as human. That's why someone from rural China, forget rural Massachusetts, mm -hmm. can get into a hip hop record. They might not even get the language. They might not even speak English. But there's an energy underneath that speaks to truth. Yeah, okay, great. And, yeah. Th and that's, that's to me what I think links the city with the rural, with the America, with the international, with you know those, those kind of things. Now, there are challenges, like if you don't know something, you repeat a word, you don't know what it means. I mean, I understand that, yeah. but I think, yeah. I, I just, I just wanna, I wanna connect real quick to this idea of public space too, but if, can, I, can I do, yeah. Cause I feel like for me in, in, my, in my creative trajectory, it's always been a multi-generational meeting point to, to create this work, you know. In the Bay Area, there were some mentors I had um, that provided space that, you know, you know, old heads in the 60s, you know what I mean, that provided guidance. It was our thing, you know what I mean, but they were always there to support, either to lend vision or guidance or whatever. Um, of course, you know, Jim, Nicola in New York and, you know, really helping that come up was just huge. It was, a, it was different generations having a conversation, not one being right or wrong. And it was the art on stage was newer generations creating it, but it was, it was always intergenerational in the mentorship and in the progression of the art. That's always been really, really key. And in hip hop especially, just as much, I would even say more than some art forms, but definitely just as much, 
in the, in the essence of it is a multi-generational conversation because the sample, mm -hmm. the sample is real mm -hmm. key. You know, and obviously you can, in you know, jazz you can hear ragtime, and rock and roll you can hear the blues. That's always been there. But in hip hop, if it's done well, if you take the essence, you actually take Ray Charles. You don't even like take a Ray Charles lesson. <laughs> you take Ray Charles, and the MC is having a dialogue yeah. with, with their elders and their ancestors. Right. That's in, the, that's in yeah. the, the essence of the DNA, right, right. just as much, if not more, than other art forms. So I think this idea of different generations connecting right. has been key. And I think for well, whatever you want to do, I would say that. Don't be afraid to reach out to the elders. We already offered them. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's key. Yeah, yeah, like understanding yeah. that's an asset that you have here too, yeah. right? So just understand your real. assets, right? More than, you know, what you lack. Yeah. You know, recognize what you have. So this person here, then, and when you're... To your point of, like, how to connect poetry and this particular form of music, give a hip-hop performance crew, Romeo and Juliet, and you have never seen them like that. Yet, try and make Shakespeare dance hip-hop. He died how many hundreds of years ago? Like, you can bring everything from a time that has already passed and bring it into a performance or a beat. Like, it just changes, but it's still the same thing. You take that very essence and change it. Yeah, and I would, if you mind me saying, I would also say that that hip hop is part of that. It's all a continuum. I mean, the root is is West African beats and music, but there's also a Western root in hip hop. You know what I mean? That there really is within the language, within the rhythms of the language. I, I don't, it, I don't think it's strictly an African American root. I might be kind of going on a limb there, but you know, I think the root is African. But the, but it's you know. So I feel like from when I look at Shakespeare, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's a, I think this is a continuum. Clearly, some of those Elizabethan poets were rugged. You know what I mean? They were, they were the Raycons. Maybe Shakespeare wasn't, but Marlowe. You know, they were some of them were gangsters. You know what I mean? I'm not saying you should be gangsters, but you know, they 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 they, they you know Marlowe. Well, they were more like the last poets, let's say. In terms no, of I think they were more like Raycon, man. They were like. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, not, I'm not saying. Not having that debate with you. No, no, no. <laughs> but I'm saying. I'm saying there was a rough. They were like. They were close to the source. That's what what sometimes can make hip hop kind of dangerous. It's close to the source. It's not as much, it's reflection, but it's close to the, those of the Elizabethan poets were close to a new energy. I'm not trying to make link, too many links, but you know, Marlowe was killed in a knife fight. A lot of them were killed in brawl fights. Like, what? You know what I mean? Like, I like, yeah, yeah. You said, what about my people? You know, you know, that was, they were, Shakespeare wasn't as rough, but a lot of other ones were ruffians, you know? You know that in, in, in South America, in Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, I can name other countries, the, 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 the combination of the African culture and the Hispanic and the immigrants and the indigenous, they created a form in, in the 1800s that was very similar, you know, it's called payadas, and it's a duel, but the duel needs to be set in decimas. So the beginning of the duel begins, you need to be smart enough to use the words to challenge your opponent, and that then led to a dagger fight that always would end up with somebody dead. Now, let's it's like what Jack Will said. Let's not think about dead in the way we think about because we don't know what, they, what that was about. Those people were, were wild people. But it's very interesting to me that this that I, I told Eugenio many times, you know, this that I hear in, on hip hop now, I, I knew in the 19th century they were already doing it. It is the African beats turning to words with rhymes. Yeah, and the potential is with hip hop, you can have the aggression without obviously the violence. Yeah. So some of these cats they carry the aggression, but it's like, how do you do it through metaphor? Where you know, to the trans uh, kind of continental identity thing, um, where specifically uh, hip hop theater festivals co-producing a, a international hip hop arts and cultural festival with the Kennedy Center that opens on March 28th, right? So in three weeks, two weeks, whatever it is, I'll be in DC for those. But it's dance, music, theater, uh, visual arts, uh, uh, hybrids, forms, right? Uh, a lot of it is uh, gonna be streamcast. You know, a lot of the performances are free and there's work from all over the world, mm -hmm. right? There's like feminists, transgender, you know, uh, African, Arabic, French, Spanish, like, you know, and, and, you know, just kind of pointing to, you know, the commonality and the power of this thing to kind of like, what, what's the baseline, you know, and it's really just like, 
all it is is an expiration. It's not even definitive, right? It's just like, this is three weeks, and this is just kind of a sample of all of this stuff, you know? Um, but, I, you know, I think it is under that spirit of, you know, the, the commonality. And to your point about global citizenship, mm. you know, I like to say that I think hip-hop was the first culture of the 21st century, you know? Mm. I think, you know, in terms of my experiences and how I came up and, and um, I believe that, especially now with, with you all in this generation too. We just literally brought Abio you know you will live the last poets to Senegal, West Africa. And the big conversation was the N-word in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, can you hear it? And Abio Dune is looking at these young people and he said to them, look, you know, his generation, meaning, and mine for that matter, as, as an African American, he was saying to them, I, I, I work hard to, to be the African brother and, and, and my African sisters. We work so hard. And here you are being the original, you, you are in the place where humanity was born and your legacy is there. And yet you, you can't find in your language to use my African brother and my African sister. You got to say my nigger and, and you don't get what that means. Please. It was, so, it was a beautiful conversation. A young poet from London, his name is Dean Atta, A-T-T-A, -T -T Dean Atta. And he just did a residency at Paul Quinn College, which is in the south side of Dallas. Um, and he has this poem called, uh, I, I, I Ain't Your Nigga, right? And it's an indictment on the use of that word. Um, but there's a line, and I'm only going to paraphrase, about how we're scared to use the word brother. Mm -hmm. or sister, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which changes the game mm -hmm. when you use those words because, you know, it's <coughs> like, I'm, I'm you know, and it, it really changes things, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and that's a bigger issue that we don't have to kind of, but it's the power of language, the power of words, and the intentionality behind it, you know? Um, that's and, a bigger conversation. Yeah, it's a bigger conversation. <laughs> this is just, um, this, yeah. yeah, so I don't know how much more time we have. The other points is back here. Yeah, yeah I wanted to say on the, um, the whole concept of, of how you get together is that um, I feel personally in, in the valley here that there's several communities that have come together and have been born out of people passionate about, I got to find space to practice. I got to find space to do my art and I got to find collective people to do it with. And like Double Edge is an example of that. I come from Earth Dance. It's a bunch of dancers going out in a farm, figuring it out for themselves. There's serious community, there's yoga communities. And I'm really curious, like, what would it be like for hip hop artists to come together, <coughs> buy an old farm, and throw down together and, like, really work on their craft, mm -hmm. you know? And that, that question is, is maybe that needs to happen. Find a space Let's and. Get that out there. Yeah, that's yeah. Exactly thing. Yeah. That's a great thing. Are. I like that. Anybody else? Back here? My thought was just about what Will said about Shakespeare and Matt's question about international communities and, and just what, and you talked about the underlying rhythm. And for me, just listening to the disparate comments on that, it just sounds like what, uh, the common thread is people who would die for their art and, and are dead without it and would die without it. But just, that I just can't imagine any artist, you know, when you talk about the generational thing, not connecting with that. So whether they, even embraced what was happening on the stage, and they see somebody that has that passion. Mm -hmm. To me, it would just seem like a common thread. Well said. You know, for, uh, for y'all, for y'all trying to figure it out here. I mean, I, you know, again, do do take best practices, take what you do have, and uh, work from there, and then try things, and don't be afraid to fail. Like fuck up, make a mistake. You know, it's cool. You keep going, you know? Because um, I, I think back to this authentic authenticity thing, it's like you got to come with your truth. You got to find that voice. And all of you will emerge as leaders in your own respective right when the time, you know, you know what I mean? Like, and that's the bigger, that's the bigger issue, right? So, you know, I, you know, I know what my long-term investments are. You know, I've developed that, uh, that clarity, but you know, it's, it's taken 40 plus years at this point, you know, to kind of really fine tune that focus. So, you know, you gotta keep working on the answers. Can I say something too? Yeah. And, and the, the, the thing that I'm really excited about is that you all can help lay the foundations for hip hop and beyond in this region for generations. 
we don't have that opportunity in Brooklyn. Those foundations are already laid. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Those people, we, we still have work to do in California and stuff like that, but the foundations are there. But you guys can lay those foundations for a whole, not to, I'm not trying to lay the heavy stuff on you. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. We'll start with the poetry. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Start with the, start with, start with the, start with the poetry. But I'm just saying, everything, when you come to something, you know, like look at this, look at this farm we're in. You know, people lay these foundations. This, this place is going to live on for like generations. It's incre incredible. You all can lay similar foundation for your aesthetic, for your generation, um, and lay it in a way that you want to see it. Mm -hmm. So that that energy, the energy of the founders of anything is still there. Does that make any sense? It's really hard to change that energy around. You can build on it, you can reform it, you can, you can, you can edit it, but it's hard. So you guys can lay some foundations now. It's not like there's like, you know, it hasn't been hip hop here for 30, 40 years necessarily in that way. You all can be the first to lay it down. That's very, very powerful. That's and all. embrace the business side. Not everybody's going to be the rapper, bro. We need managers. We need organizers. We need promoters. We need, we need, no, we need the master planners. You know, I'm just saying, because you you know, you're the one who said you do, that's part of what you do, right? So if you're good at it, you know. Yeah, that's very key, actually. All right. Do you want anything? You want to close with anything, Eugenio? Okay. Um, I'm gonna close with. Uh, I hear the part about the sample. You know, it, it's. I feel like when we where we live right now, we are finding that that practice of taking something that we've heard before and repeating it. So, I mean, we are very open to the to the past generations. We do hear it because we have the samples. We heard it in this way, you know, and that, and like, you know, we may not get together and do the live performance, like, like I don't walk down the street and somebody, but, you know, I still, right, right, right. when I play music, when, Jaquil showed me this guy, Chance the Rapper, who's from the south side of Chicago, where I've never been before in my life, but through what he says, I saw it, and also I saw things that he was doing that I was doing out here in the sticks, like, there's a song called Cocoa Butter Kisses where like his, he just wants love from his mom, but he's off like smelling like cigarettes and stuff. And, like I was right there, you know, like right there on that same plane, you know. But that's but that's the thing. Like we're not we we see samples from different places. We connect to them, but they're all different. We see the differences too. We see like we go through and we look for authenticity. Like I, I see like. Flatbush Zombie, this guy's had like this huge beard, this multicolored like thing going on and like 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 the grills were like all like spiky and weird like but I was like wow what is that? You know? Like we we're open, you know? We're open and we, we have the access to all the different types of stuff. So now what we gotta do is is come together and make it happen. I'll be watching. <laughs> Thank you. There's plenty of opportunity for more intimate conversations as well. There's some coffee and tea, there's some food. And again, let's hear it again for our amazing guests, Clyde Valentine and Will Power. Thank you. <laughs>